Recording. So this seminar is being recorded and the recording will be available on the Nordicast webpage. So very welcome everyone. This is the third Nordicast online seminar and on this occasion we're going to talk about rapid AST directly from blood culture bottles as described by UCAST. And we realize that many of you have not implemented this yet, or are maybe not going to implement it either. So, uh, <clears throat> but we're going to give you an opportunity to discuss the pros and cons, the difficulties, when is the time, how to do it, etc., etc. And uh, Per, and some of you can see the picture of Per, Riedström from uh, the laboratory in Vecture, who has worked um, very much with the implementation of RAST in the clinical laboratory. Uh, he will later present results. What, what happened? What effects did we get from that? Uh, what can you expect in a Nordic setting? But before we do that, uh, and also Karianne Wiget uh, from, uh, from Norway will uh, discuss uh, Rust in Norway uh, from a questionnaire that was distributed uh, some uh, short time ago. And following that, we will have time for discussion. So let's start. If you have questions during the presentations, you can send them in the chat, we will pick them up at the end. So just a few very initial slides to remind us what life is, what life is like today. All initial therapy of bloodstream infections is empiric because you cannot afford to wait until you have an AST result. No one today has a method by which you can actually advise on therapy as the patient uh, comes through the door in the ER or the infectious disease clinic or wherever the patient comes through the door. So all initial therapy is empiric. And of course, the success of empiric therapy depends on the choice of antibiotic. And then we should remember that, for example, vancomycin is a rather crap antibiotic as compared to IV cloxacillin, just to take one example. So the success rate, if everything else is the same, uh, of cloxacillin IV on a Staphylococcus aureus septicemia is roughly 95%. Um, and the corresponding success rate with vancomycin is somewhere around 80, 82%. And then of course, uh, it depends on resistance rates. So if you have lots and lots of ampicillin resistance, like we have now, for example, 40, 50, 60%, depending on exactly where we are, Empiric therapy with ampicillin alone is going to fail in 50% of the cases. Increasing resistance rates drive empiric therapy towards more active, broader, and more expensive therapy, and that in turn drives resistance. So when everyone is afraid of using ampicillin or amoxiclav, and maybe they go to Piprocil and Tazobactam, and when they lose confidence in Piprocil and Tazobactam, they will go to Meropenem, uh, and eventually they will start looking at Meropenem, Vabrobactam, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a constant drift towards safer, more expensive, more broad spectrum, more active, um, and eventually uh, we drive resistance in that way. <coughs> So in countries with low resistance rates, failures are few with empiric therapy and go unnoticed or we make excuses when they happen. Whereas in countries where resistance is high, even to the most broad spectrum and active agents such as carbapenems, it's natural to consider empiric therapy with agents such as colistin, ceftazidine, mavibactam, ceftolazine, tazobactam, meropenem vabobactam, imipenem relobactam, um, and that, of course, drives resistance and cost in Turkey, Greece, Thailand, 
uh, Egypt, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Even if you're in a place where resistance is not very high, a shortened time for AST in acute bloodstream infections will reduce the need, the time, if you like, for broad spectrum therapy. Because of course, we also like to play it safe. We do not want to sacrifice patients because we made a poor choice of empiric therapy. So we also tend to use safe agents and to forego the use of, let's call them older agents. Um, but if we could have a susceptibility report, which said that this E. coli belongs to the 50%, which is actually susceptible to ordinary ampicillin, that would probably change our behavior. When you assess the need for introducing rapid AST in bloodstream infections in your laboratory, you need to assess what is the risk of failure with the empiric therapy, which is popular in my hospital today and is used for serious infections with E. coli, Klebsiella pneumonia, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus pneumonia, Enterococcus faecalis, and Fecum. You don't have to think much about Proteus mirabilis, Entrobacter cloicae, and a few of those other rarer organisms. The ones you're looking at here normally comprise 80, 85% of anything that is in a positive blood culture. And they certainly represent those infections that are virginal in patients acquired at home that patients will suffer from when they step across uh, 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 through the door in the ER or in the infectious disease clinic or wherever they step through the door. You also need to assess, would a timely report on the susceptibility of relevant agents offer a chance to downscale therapy, maybe one or even two days earlier than in the current setting? because that would be an advantage. It would save on some of those more active, more expensive agents that we want to save uh, for the future. And I think the third question we need to ask ourselves is, do we aim to signal to patients, clinical colleagues and administrators that we're important um, in general and uh, important uh, when it comes to the diagnostics of bloodstream infections? Do we want to put our feet foot forward and do something which is seen as an active move to be part of everyday clinical life? But there are other aspects on rapid bloodstream infection diagnostics than just the AST or the time for AST. And I think we all need to ask ourselves these questions. Is there a delay in the ER? Are bottles immediately transported when taken? And when we started this work many years ago now, we discovered that nurses in the ER were mandated to take blood cultures, but they were not mandated to send them to the lab. That needed a, a doctor's decision. And that's on average delayed everything by four hours, which in hindsight was really stupid. And then, of course, is there a delay in transportation uh, itself? Do we know what proportion of bottles is delayed for more than one hour, for one to four hours, and for more than four hours between sampling and the time it reaches the blood uh, cabinet, blood culture cabinet? And in some countries across Europe, this particular item has been made one of those quality um, um, uh, assess uh, assessment items uh, and where some hospitals are not given their, um, do not obtain support from the government unless they can show that these times have been reduced to under four hours, for example. One of those really stupid questions, is the blood culture cabinet available to healthcare workers 24 seven? Or is it locked away between five uh, in the afternoon and seven the next morning? 
And we may laugh at that now because I don't think anyone would have their blood cabinet not available. Uh, but if you go five years back, and we did some questionnaires in those days, more than half the laboratories had actually locked their blood culture cabinet uh, into the lab, and it was not possible to introduce bottles uh, between five in the afternoon and eight and uh, seven in the morning. And then, of course, the question, are we handling blood culture, positive blood culture bottles 24-7? Uh, or have we invented other ways to improve the time between positive signal and diagnostics? Because the, the obvious way is, of course, to make sure the lab is open at all times. And, and then that problem goes away, provided the people who man the laboratory have the, have the skills to, to deal with positive blood cultures. But there are, are other ways to, to reduce, reduce that time. And I think a fourth or fifth question you need to ask yourself is, are we in our lab, uh, do we have the capacity to produce a species ID within one hour or at least within four hours from retrieving the bottle uh, to the clinical colleague and knowing the species wins half the battle. So it's very important to be told as early as possible that this is a Staphylococcus aureus and not an E. coli, or this is an E. coli and not a, and not a strep pneumonia or whatever, um, because that will uh, give you the opportunity to fine tune your empiric therapy. And also, I think it behoves all of us to actually know what the current turnaround time on AST in blood cultures is in our laboratory. It's a good starting point for further discussions on do we need to do something. Um, yeah, that means you should think about all of these things. So let's go to the UCAST Rapid AST Directive from Positive Blood Cultures. It, the development started some five years ago, I think, roughly. Um, we, we tried a number of different ways of doing this, including uh, subculturing the bottle for one hour, four hours, et cetera, et cetera, harvesting, uh, harvesting the, the, the um, uh, bacteria from the blood culture and then spinning it and then resuspending it to get the perfect inoculum of 0.5 McFarlane and all of that. And all those things actually delayed the reading of an AST. Uh, we shocked the bacteria by spinning them. Uh, their lag phase increased and there was no way we could read anything after four hours with all the other um, um, ways of doing this. So we eventually came up with um, a method where we take the blood culture uh, soup, if you like, uh, bacteria and broth from the blood culture bottle and we inoculate it directly onto the Muirhinton or Muirhinton F plates. And we have validated that procedure for the four major manufacturers of bottles. Uh, by Maria BD and Thermo Fisher and two bottles from one of them. And you take uh, some 100 to 150 microliters, it's not absolutely precise, uh, and you, you put it on the, the plate and you um, make sure that you spread it around properly. And then you read sewn di diameters after four hours, six hours, and eight hours. And if you have a sound diameter which can be read and interpreted after four hours, you don't need to read it after six hours. If you don't have a readable, interpretable result at four hours, then you need to read it at six hours. Um, and if you can't read it at six hours for whatever reason, then you read it at eight hours. You don't read at four and a half hours or five and a half hours or six and a half hours. You read it at four, six and or eight hours. And currently, we are now uh, investigating whether we can continue incubation beyond eight hours uh, and read plates at 16, 20, and 24 hours. And we already now know that we can do that. And we already know that we cannot use the tables uh, constructed for four, six, or eight hours. We're going to need at least one more table long incubation table. We also know that we cannot use the standard table 
So it's going to be a, a fourth table, if you like, or tab in the Excel um, sheets uh, where you could choose uh, the four hour read or the six hour read or the eight hour read. And we are going to introduce a 16 to 24 or possibly a 16 and 24 hour read depending on the results that we're now getting. We're using exactly the same material that we used uh, in the development of the uh, current methodology, which is a, all, all of them are clinical isolates, but they are put together, the material is put together to guarantee that we have enough uh, resistant uh, isolates, enough resistance mechanisms, resistance genes, whatever, different ESBLs, different KPCs, et cetera, et cetera. It will take another six months at least before we're ready to come up with um, recommendations online. So breakpoint tables and QC uh, are available on the website. They are specific for the species and specific for the incubation time. Uh, these are now developed and validated for E. coli, Klebsiella pneumonia, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Acinetobacter baumani, Staph aureus, Streptococcus pneumonia, E. fecalis, and E. fecium. And some people would say, why waste time on Acinetobacter baumani? We have very few of those in our blood cultures, but that's not the word that comes back from, from Turkey or Greece or Italy. Um, and of course, these were developed uh, to cover uh, the better part of, of the world. <coughs> We're not planning to introduce further species. First of all, it's extremely costly to do these things. Secondly, um, the UCAR steering committee uh, members cannot agree on whether Enterobacter cloacae would be more important than Proteus mirabilis, uh, or whether Proteus mirabilis is more important than some other bug. Uh, and I think that illustrates that there is no absolute natural candidate uh, to go on that list. Um, and also, I think it illustrates that many other bacteria that we find in blood cultures are sort of the result of prolonged healthcare, in hospital healthcare. And we often know that this person has had a catheter uh, related infection with an enterobacter cloacae and then eventually develops a septicemia. So there are fewer surprises with other species than there are with E. coli, Klebsiella, uh, pneumonia, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Acinetobacter baumani, Staph aureus, Streptococcus pneumonia, E. fecalis, and E. fecium. But you may have different opinions about that. <clears throat> The method basically provides susceptible and resistant. Um, and susceptible may be in the form of susceptible uh, standard exposure or susceptible at increased exposure when the wild type is I. But the method does not provide results on those eyes that are the result of low level resistance, but have been deemed possible to reach with increased exposure, uh, because those are hidden in the ATU and there is no way we can extract them from the ATU in any reliable manner. So it's very much a black and white test. Um, and the ATU in the middle there is of course to prevent um, very major and major errors. Um, and these are kept very, very low by the introduction of the area of technical uncertainty, where interpretation is not allowed, and where you put the plates back in the thermostat and you hope for the best when you're going to read them at six hours or at eight hours. The method has been validated in 55 clinical laboratories in northern and southern Europe. Um, and all except, if I remember correctly, three uh, considered the whole thing totally unproblematic. Um, uh, three labs had problems and we uh, think we can uh, couple those problems to the fact that those laboratories uh, were not at all used to disk testing uh, at all. Um, and they were probably floundering a bit because of that. 
But I've also seen on the PubMed that an increasing number of eval evaluations are now being published one after the other. Uh, the basic methodology and development is in that first paper there, the UCAS rapid distribution, blah, blah, blah. And then the field trial trial is now available in uh, also in the Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy um, and, and the reference is there. And here is a, a flurry of, of publications that you find on PubMed if you enter the word UCAST RAST. That's where you find the method, rapid AST in blood cultures, and you have a few choices. Um, uh, the method is described, the breakpoints, and then there is a special section for how to screen for important resistance mechanism, uh, uh, mechanisms using the RAST. Uh, this is the, the first uh, page of the table, and you will recognize the, the traditional UCAST format. Um, and you can, you can click on the links uh, and, and go directly to the page you want. There are some uh, explanations, uh, and I will not read them to you now, but just so you can know that you can go in and read some of those explanations, and there is also information on the ATU and how to uh, deal with that. Um, there are uh, UCAST, uh, sorry, there are QC recommendations for uh, three strains, if I remember correctly. And here is the procedure that you need to go through. You inoculate the uh, blood culture bottle, you incubate it, um, et cetera, et cetera. You wait for the positive signal. You plate your bottle in exactly the same way that you would plate your clinical bottles uh, and you read them at four, six and eight hours. And for you have for each of them, you have a target, you have a range um, at each of those times. The fact that some of these are yellow is just because they were introduced this year rather than last year. So they are additions. And you can see that the menu of agents for E. coli um, is fairly wide, uh, but as Kariana pointed out, ampicillin is not in there. And as someone else pointed out, amoxicillin clavulanic acid is not in there. Um, so not everything is in there. Uh, the only thing I can say to defend myself is that the things that are in there are those that the steering committee jointly agreed were the most relevant agents for uh, septicemia treatment. I brought this slide uh, to the presentation simply to show you for the E. coli ATCC strain, and it's representative of any old E. coli, and just to show you what happens over time. So you can see for each of those lines, you have a four hour, you have six hour and an eight hour read, and it's repeat readings uh, 10 at least. Um, and you can see that at four hours, the most common zone is 16 millimeters and the range is from 14 to 17. That increases somewhat at six hours and again, maybe somewhat at eight hours. And the green and the blue uh, are the standard uh, QC ranges and targets. So the standard QC range, um, which is read at, of course, 16 to 20 hours, uh, you would see that the target is 24 instead of 16, uh, and the range is from 21 to 27. So what this slide really tells you is exactly how much um, do zone diameters increase uh, with uh, gradually increasing incubation time. And you can see that for some agents, it's more than for other agents. You can see that meropenem you add at least five millimeters uh, between four and eight hours for ciprofloxacin, roughly the same, whereas for gentamicin, the increase is not that dramatic. <laughs> I think the one of the conclusions from this slide is that there is no way you will be able to use the standard breakpoint table to interpret your uh, rapid AST from, from, um, um, from blood culture bottles. And for those of you who are interested in what CLSI do or does, um, CLSI is trying to manipulate their rapid AST so that they can use the standard table because they don't want to, to have another table, uh, but they are failing 
And I think they are now beginning to see that they need to produce a specific table for short reads. And this is for E. faecalis, and you can see that for vancomycin, it doesn't actually matter whether you incubate four, six, or eight hours. And you're almost on the regular uh, targets. There is one or two millimeters lacking. And for gentamicin, you can see that standard incubation and rapid incubation is basically the same, whereas for imipenem, there is quite a difference. So it's important to know that, you know, reading early or reading late uh, gives you different results for different species and for different antibiotics. And as a sideline, I can tell you that if you read MICs at four, six, eight hours, uh, 12 hours, 16 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, your MICs will gradually increase um, as time for incubation increases. So here is just one example, namely the E. coli uh, breakpoint table. And you can see that there is a four hour column, there is a six hour column and an eight hour column. And uh, the S more than or equal to, the R less than, are listed and then the ATU is listed. And if you have a sown diameter results of uh, 12 to 16 at four hours for Piptazo, you should not interpret that. This is a separate document. Um, and some of you will remember that there was a link from the first page uh, where you can screen for resistance mechanisms with UCAST RAST. So, um, instead of once you have used the regular criteria for reading your uh, sown diameters and allocating S's, R's, and ATU's to them, you can also use specific breakpoints uh, to suspect uh, ESBL production, for example. So, if the ceftaxim 5 microgram uh, disc. Uh, produces a zone of less than 15 uh, at four hours, less than 16 at six hours, and less than 17 at eight hours, you can suspect that there is a, an ESBL uh, uh, for an E. coli. And you can see that for the Klebs Klebsiella pneumonia, the values are not exactly the same, but they are very close. And further down, you can see that there is a table for screening for carbapenemase producing E. coli and Klebsiella pneumonia. And I actually saw an Italian study uh, very recently, which hasn't been published yet, um, but which has been submitted for publication. And they had tried this page uh, to rapidly screen for those resistance mechanisms that we are now looking at. And they reported uh, that they were uh, very successful and very pleased with the result. So before I hand over, this is just to show you uh, uh, a typical background result. All of these are available in the publication. Um, <clears throat> so for anyone who's really interested in, in looking at these, they're all available in the Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy presentation. And the clinical results for the 55 laboratories, many of you actually participated in that are also available in the uh, uh, supplementary results on the, of the 55 laboratory article in Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. And this is just to show you how this, these results were set up, UCAST wise, you know, with different colors, depending on whether a bug was deemed resistant, reddish colors or uh, susceptible, greenish colors. And of course, the, the proof is in the pudding. So it all goes back to the MIC breakpoints at uh, regular incubation, 16 to 20 hours, and the sown diameter breakpoints at regular incubation. And you've got the regular incubation results to the right there, 16 to 20 hours. Um, and then you have the results at four hours, six hours, and eight hours. And as you can see, one of the striking effects is that the wild type moves to the right gradually with time. Uh, the resistant population sort of moves to the left. And the separation between the wild type and the non-wild type increases with time. And that, of course, is very important because if you uh, increase the separation between the wild type and the non-wild type, you also increase the robustness, if you like, of the method. 
all of that shows how important it is to have separate breakpoints for short reads, four hours, six hours, eight hour reads. And here you can see how the uh, area of technical uncertainty operates with these results. You can see that in this case, it's two millimeters where you have lots of overlap and where you're prevented from, from actually uh, interpreting your results. So if, is there any uh, sort of very immediate question on that? You can either raise your hand or just unmute yourself or speak up or whatever. Uh, I'm looking at the chat. There is nothing in the chat right now. Anyone? Otherwise, I will say to Per, take it away, Per. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me well? Fine. Fine, good, thank you. Uh, my name is Per Rydström. I am a clinical microbiologist at the lab in Kronoberg in, and Blekinge in Sweden. And this is our experience with introducing uh, rapid AST in our two clinical laboratories. And uh, Gunnar will do the uh, slide switching. Thank you. So uh, we had to do some preparations before we could introduce rapid AST into our laboratory. Uh, I, uh, Gunnar told you before, uh, there is no I category besides the, uh, uh, the substitute for S. Uh, so we had to uh, ask ourselves how to deal with the ATU. Uh, how do we report an ATU to the clinician without may confusing them and uh, still giving the impression that we are performing a, uh, um, an AST and this might change from four to six hours of reading uh, or it might need uh, a regular AST the day after uh, just to make sure that they realize that this uh, substance is possibly still uh, something they could use clinically but um, we really don't know which way uh, it will turn to either an R or an S. We chose to go with resistensbestemning uh, pågår in Swedish um, which means uh, the AST is still in progress. So we are still, you know, um, performing an AST for this particular antibiotic and more results will follow. We had to um, discuss how to deal with the RAST uh, results. We use a lab information system called uh, WW Lab, and there is no inherent support there. Um, if we were to integrate it uh, fully, there would be many breakpoints. Uh, one breakpoint for each antibiotic reading time and uh, species, and that would lead to a lot of breakpoints to maintain, and that would take a lot of time and would cost at least some money. Uh, we wanted as far as possible to avoid manual interpretation of the breakpoint table to decrease the risk of reading at the wrong line or the wrong column. Uh, so we wanted some sort of automatic interpretation still. Um, and of course, we wanted to log everything to make sure that we knew what we were doing. Uh, so we could show everybody else that we were doing the correct thing and uh, also to be able to evaluate um, how uh, well we're performing afterwards. So traceability was important. Uh, we had an older, less validated, fast direct AST method from blood cultures already in use. Uh, and um, we had some experience with this and uh, many of our lab technicians were used to this and it was performed routinely uh, on blood cultures, but the, there were few or fewer at least um, breakpoints or, or bug drug combinations than for uh, the UCOST methodology. Next please. So we had to do some uh, preparations when it came to training. We had some practical training. We had spiked bottles and, and reading exercises where we compared some diameters and uh, where everyone discussed um, uh, advantages and disadvantages with this compared to the regular AST and the other rapid or faster AST method. Um, we had some theoretical uh, information to uh, both of our la laboratories, laboratories and we had to update uh, all of our own documentation to reflect this. 
uh, we had to inform um, the recipients of our answers, the clinicians, the, mostly the ID physicians and um, everyone working um, uh, as um, clinicians to uh, point out what this rapid AST or the, these answers would actually reflect that these are preliminary answers. They might change from four to six hours. They most often don't, but they might. And they might change from the rapid AST to the regular AST the day after. And uh, since we were not to use the uh, already in uh, the um, AST, AST system already in place in our lab information system, uh, we had to inform them that uh, the rapid AST, the appearance of it would uh, be different from um, what our regular AST would look like. We had to um, allocate resources. We had to move some staff around so that we made sure that we had more uh, staff in the morning where the work is more intensive. We do a lot of things in parallel in the morning when we uh, harvest all the bottles from the blood, uh, blood culture cabinets. Uh, we already uh, performed a Maldetov uh, directly from blood culture bottles. Um, and we do the regular stuff as well. We do the gram stain and the plating and we, uh, we call or give telephone reports to the, the clinicians. And um, now we would also perform the rapid AST. So we added another thing to our morning procedure and we would realize that this could take more manpower to do. So we decided in advance that we would continue to perform uh, the regular AST, the 18 hour AST uh, on all isolates uh, as a comparison and as a backup. Um, next please. And then uh, I uh, wrote a, an Excel document uh, for interpretation against uh, RAST breakpoints that uh, uh, performs an automatic interpretation and uh, uh, there is a, a saving function where you can log uh, your zone diameters and the results of the interpretation into a separate log file and an easy way to pretty much just copy and paste the results from this uh, rapid AST into our lab information system uh, to reduce the number of um, uh, possible errors that could otherwise occur. Uh, it's supposed to be easy to use, very self-explanatory and fairly easy to maintain as well when it comes to updating of the breakpoints and adding new species. So we had this document was written by me and um, we, uh, it, it's yeah, uh, very easy for us to do whatever we want to do with it pretty much. And this is an example of how it could look like. Uh, up uh, next, please, Gunnar. Then you, you would highlight the uh, uh, top left corner where uh, we can choose a species. Of, I'm sorry, this is in Swedish, but we have it in Swedish, of course. Um, so we um, can choose between all the different species. The date and time is, is pre-filled. And then you use your barcode scanner to scan your uh, lab identification number. Uh, and then you can choose between four, six or eight hours, depending on species, of course, for the uh, time of incubation. You uh, register your zone diameters in millimeters for the corresponding antibiotics. In, you can press next, Gunnar, and it's, there, there it is. Um, and you have small asterisks that only say that we register these zone diameters for imipenem, for example, and trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole. Uh, we just register them since we have them plated and just for future use uh, in case we, for some reason, need them. Uh, you can write your own comment, uh, which is saved as well, and you have your uh, signature or uh, you sign it with a code of your cho choosing. And uh, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the interpretation that is automatic. In this case, it pretend presents with a box that says, uh, preliminary uh, AST after four hours, ceftacidim R, and so on. Um, 
and cefotaxim says pogor, which, mean, which means in Swedish it's in progress. What you do then is that you press the green button, which has copy, and then you go to your lab information system and just paste it in a comment box, sort of. And this uh, text is then appended to the preliminary answer that is sent out to the clinicians. You then go back to the Excel document and press save and clear the orange one, or just press the red one if you made a if you made a typo, and then it's saved, and then you can process your next uh, your next um, rapid AST. So, uh, just to give you some background, we have two laboratories that we um, introduced this to at the same time in Vecco and Karlskrona. We have open hours from between normally between seven thirty and uh, five thirty in the afternoon. Sometimes this is. Uh, shortened to 1600 hours, uh, depending on uh, how good our staffing situation is. Um, we serve uh, around 360,000 people uh, spread out in two counties. Um, and we have four hospitals, two major ones in uh, Växjö and Kolskrona and two smaller ones in Ljungby and Karlshamn. Uh, like Gunnar said, we have the blood uh, cabinets are available 24 seven. And in the larger hospitals, they are placed next to our clinical laboratories. Um, but in the smaller hospitals, they are located in clinical chemistry, which has a 24-7 um, thing going on. And from the, uh, the smaller hospitals, the positive bottles are delivered uh, by car two, three, sometimes more times daily, depending on how much there's to send and if uh, it's, uh, anything else needs to be sent. So at least two or three times, including the weekends. Uh, we introduced rapid AST in our labs in middle of 2018. And for the first year, uh, we uh, let the, the technicians decide whether to read the rapid AST at four or six hours. And it was mostly up to the clinicians uh, to choose uh, from how much other work they had uh, to be done. Um, some uh, people had an easier time to read four and some uh, did more six hour uh, readings. But uh, uh, after uh, approximately one year, we tried to change it to go to um, mostly four or to have a four hour reading and uh, then read a six hour reading as a comparison. Uh, the comparison between the four hour and six hour reading that we want to do has still not yet been done. Something came up, Corona, I suppose. And um, we want to make sure that we're not missing out on anything by only doing the four hour read, which I'm pretty sure that we will not, but we need to uh, assess this and then uh, probably just stop reading the six hour reads whenever uh, the four hour is okay. So we had to um, make some sort of evaluation of this and to do it sort of systematically, we had to uh, decide on what to compare to before the introduction of rapid AST. So we decided to uh, go with time to first AST report. And uh, the starting time when the timer starts counting is when the first bottle of a pair or two pairs is withdrawn from the blood cabinet. Uh, this is from reported from the machine's log file, that is. And the end time uh, is when the first AST is reported to the clinician, regardless of what method is used. So um, some might be uh, with a, a rapid AST, uh, some might be with the regular 18 hour uh, regular AST, and before the introduction of rapid AST, it would be a mix between the regular 18 hour AST and uh, that uh, the, the present uh, faster AST we had at that point in time. And of course, since the blood uh, culture bottles um, might need to be transported, transportation time is included in this uh, first time to AST. Uh, please, next Gunnar. We also need to uh, assess uh, the reasons why rapid AST was not performed. Was it some systematic error? Was it something that we could change by changing the hours that we work or change the, the, the times the uh, blood culture bottles were transported to the lab? Or was there anything else we could um, do to shorten the time to, um, 
to be able to make a rapid AST. Um, so we need to find out why. Uh, next, please. And I put this point in parentheses, but uh, we also wanted to very uh, make a verification of the performance that uh, is presented in the um, earlier uh, articles that Gunnar uh, was describing, uh, the performance of the method itself, just to make sure that we have not introduced a systematic error in the way that we have set up the rapid AST. I'm not going to show, show you any slides of this, uh, this point in time, but uh, it's, it's perfect. Next, Gunnar. Thank you. So we included all the samples from bl uh, blood culture bottles. In our labs, we use blood culture bottles for blood cultures, of course, but also uh, other sterile materials such as cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, all these cultures were included. Um, like I said, only the first positive bottle was included. So if we uh, had performed the rapid AST on the first bottle, um, that was positive, uh, all the subsequent bottles were ignored, uh, even if they were positive, you know, 22 hours after. Uh, of course, we had to have a species with the rapid AC breakpoints, uh, it goes without saying. Um, and we excluded, uh, like I said, the subsequent positive bottles. We also excluded um, mixed cultures for obvious reasons. And we excluded follow-up samples. For example, if uh, the clinicians were to draw a 72-hour sample in a staph aureus septicemia uh, as a check, uh, we wouldn't perform a rapid AST. I mean, we did it on some staph aureus in these cases, but normally we wouldn't want to force it. Uh, we also had to have something to compare with. We had to have a control group. So we chose 100 at that time. It seemed like a a good number. Right now it's probably a bit too small. We had, uh, we chose a hundred isolates uh, backwards counting consecutive uh, from uh, the start date of 25th of May 2018 and backwards. Um, and the distribution, the distribution uh, of species in this control group was very similar to uh, what we saw in the uh, after introduction or introduction of RAST which is natural, of course. Um, and like I said previously, in this control group, we performed re the regular 18-hour AST and the uh, previous local uh, method for direct AST from blood bottles. So it's, it's a faster method uh, mixed with the regular method, but it's, you know, it's real life examples. It's as good as it got back then. And uh, this is a chart of, um, uh, the fraction of uh, isolates that we could perform RAST on, or that we had RAST results from, rather. So this is after the introduction of rapid AST, and each bar represents the species, named down below. And um, on your right-hand side, there is a small table uh, that shows you the number of isolates. And if you were to look at the table, you would see that the E. coli, Klebsiella, and Staph aureus represents, uh, you can press next to Gunnar, and you would see that it would make out 86% of all isolates that have RAST breakpoints. So uh, the three bars on the left are the three main suspects. And as you can see, uh, we can deliver RAST results on 80% of our all of all our E. coli uh, isolates, and more than that for Klebsiella, and slightly less for Staph aureus. So for the main three culprits, you have excellent results. You could press next, Gunnar, and uh, it would show you that uh, on average we can perform rapid AST on 78% of all isolates. In, uh, it, I mean, it means that you can have uh, a rapid AST on 78% of, um, of all of these species on the same day, which I think is really great. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, a representation of how the time to first AST changed from before RAST to after rapid AST. So down below, um, you have the control group, pre-RAST, 100 isolates. Medel is mean in Swedish, 
and median. Um, it's expressed in hours, minutes, and seconds. And you can compare, compare that to the top all RAST, uh, which is two hours of readings. Uh, and the median time for all RAST is around seven hours as compared to 19 hours for the um, control group. Um, in the middle row, you can see the results from after we changed our way of working to uh, um, focus more on four hour readings and try not to have six hour readings. You can see that you could further improve your um, uh, time to first AST by more than an hour. Next, Gunnar. Oh, there we, there we are. And you need to, yeah, like that. Look at that. So this is just a histogram to show you um, what, uh, how the distributions actually look like. And uh, if you look at the gray one, the control group, you can see that you have a, uh, some of them, less than half are reported on the same day. And then you have a big chunk on your right. Um, and those are delayed to the day after. Uh, if you compare that to the um, orange one, the bar in the middle, it would represent all the uh, times after RAST had been introduced and we were focusing on the four hour read. Very few uh, results were uh, presented at 18 hours, which is the day after, the morning after. Um, and this goes to show that um, RAST drastically improves your time to first AST. And uh, even though you have a rapid method, which we thought at the time back in 2018, um, it really varies depending on the isolate. And um, if you have a good combination of, of uh, or you have a good species that you can perform uh, rapid uh, AST on. Next please Gunnar. So uh, the reasons why we couldn't perform uh, rapid AST was of course interesting to know. Um, the biggest bar is the one on the left, which is we had a positive bottle that um, we couldn't handle within our working hours. Let's say if we were closing the lab at 17.30, half past five and it became, or uh, yeah, it was positive at around four o'clock. No time left that day to perform rapid AST. And uh, the next largest uh, bar, you can press next, Gunnar. Uh, there we go, oh yeah, okay. So uh, ID delayed, uh, that's almost always pneumococci. Uh, I think there was a pseudomonas and uh, a couple of um, enterococcus in there. But sometimes uh, species identification is hard with pneumococci. And so uh, out of the 22 isolates where I deemed uh, the uh, species identification to be the reason why uh, rapid AST could not be performed, it was in uh, 12 of those cases were pneumococci. Sometimes I couldn't tell whether it was uh, RAST that couldn't be read because it was hard to read, uh, bad growth or something else, or the reason why a rapid AST hadn't been read was just simply unknown. Um, we don't really know which is which sometimes, but there is also there was always going to be um, an, a small number of, of rapid AST plates that can't be read because the growth is too, too poor. Uh, next please Gunnar. So yeah, we have this, okay, you can go back one, there we are. Uh, the weekend one, um, this, uh, th these bars, these stati statistics include um, the time where we had a lot of six hour readings. So this weekend bar, uh, we have a limited open hours during weekends. And uh, if you were to focus on six hour reads, uh, there would be a lot of isolates that simply wouldn't fit in the weekend or fit in during your working day. So. Uh, this weekend bar has been, um, it, it's, slight, it's very reduced nowadays since we mostly perform four hour reads. Uh, but depending on how long you're, you're working, they, they, this, uh, is, this might not be that big of a drastic change for you. But for us, it was a big drastic change when we changed to a four hour read because then you could fit in much more um, rapid ASTs during the weekend. Uh, this is a represent representation of 
um, how the results are from the uh, different hospitals. Um, we have uh, Jungby and Karlsam, that's the second and fourth uh, set of bars, the uh, per peripheral hospitals, uh, an hour's drive from uh, the, the major cities. And this goes to show that even though you have to transport a positive blood culture bottle uh, to your main laboratory, um, this only adds a little bit of time from when the blood, blood, is, blood culture bottle is drawn from your uh, cabinet to you have an AST. It, it adds the transportation time pretty much, uh, an hour and 10 minutes of handling. Um, so it's very feasible to do with if you have uh, cabinets in smaller hospitals. It only goes to show that as long as you have good transportation and you sort out your logistics, it's very much possible to do. Uh, next, Gunnar. So a couple of conclusions. Um, you can perform uh, or you can have RAST results uh, on most isolates with breakpoints on the same day. I'd say now we have more than 80%. Um, and uh, RAST drastically shortens the time to your first um, AST and um, by a lot, I would say. Outsource blood culture cabinets works fine with that. And uh, uh, you, of course, need to have your transportation set up, but you need that uh, otherwise as well. So this is just one more reason to look over your logistics to make sure you have your bottles as soon as you open your lab. Uh, it's very much feasible to read your rapid ASTS four hours, especially for the, the, the major uh, pathogens, E. coli, Klebsiella, and I would say Staph aureus as well. It will require some effort and reorganization. Uh, for us, it was not that hard. We had experience from a, uh, uh, the other previous rapid uh, direct uh, AST method that we had implemented. Um, we see that, of course, if you don't have that, you have to allocate resources. Um, you have to uh, start doing direct ID with Molotov before you have to do the reading. So you have uh, an ID to uh, know where to, in the breakpoint table, to read your results. Um, you have to think twice on how to interpret the breakpoint table if you want to have it automatically or you want to uh, have someone uh, do it manually. Um, so you might have to change the way you work in order to implement rapid AST. But for us, it was a very small change, I would say. Uh, and we have gotten used to it. And no one thinks twice now about doing it. Uh, you can, thank you. And I would just like to add that uh, if you ask our clinicians, they take this pretty much for granted. They get it without asking for it. They know it's there. They know how to interpret the results. They know how, they know the limitations of this. They also know that sometimes we um, uh, have results in antibiotics that we are we're not giving them. So we can have a discussion about them or discussion about them, whether to report it or not report it. Uh, so our clinicians take this very much for granted and I think it's a very useful tool for them. Um, we don't have very high resistance numbers. Uh, we have between five and 8% uh, ESBLs in blood. Uh, so empirical therapy would fail in those cases unless we had rapid AST. So um, I think this is a great addition and this is a great tool for uh, many labs. And um, if you have any questions regarding this or anything else, you can email me. If you were to skip to the next slide, Gunnar, you have my email address there. Or if you want our Excel program, by the way, you can have that. Yeah, I think that probably a lot of people will be interested in having the Excel uh, program, which I can vouch for is very easy to, to use uh, once you've got the hang of it. And it's not difficult to um, to set up uh, for your respective labs. So um, thank you very much, Per. Excellent, excellent presentation and representation of what life in is is in true life. What true life is, um, and I think we'll take questions after Karianne has presented her slides as well, and then we can have a general discussion for almost half an hour, if you like. Uh, so, Karianne, take it away. Thank you. 
you. You can hear me well? Can you hear yes, me well? Hear you fine. Yeah, we hear you fine. So I'm going to uh, just present a few results from our little survey we started. Um, for those who were uh, at our last uh, seminar, I presented I and ATU, and today we'll do the uh, Rust. If you take one more, you know. So this is a uh, survey we sent out to all our laboratories and thus far we have uh, 14 answers and I suspect after a little uh, uh, extra emails that we'll get from all 20 and that's important for us to know a little about what's going on and uh, where we as AFA might be of help. So we'll compile all the results uh, in a report and we also hope that the different laboratories will be inspired to uh, share some of their at least success stories where they've actually had success in implementing some of these things. One major disadvantage, of course, is that there are very many different LIS systems around in Norway. So it's not so easy to just take one successful way of doing it uh, and implementing uh, in a different LIS system. But I really uh, like your Excel um, uh, file there. so. I'll be one to <laughs> email you. <laughs> okay, you can take the next. So our ma uh, two uh, major questions um, were, uh, have you implemented uh, Rust? Uh, where more than, uh, or only a third said yes. And um, the other, which is very important, uh, I know you all know, is that if you have technical solutions in your LIS system for Rust when, to account for different reading time points and different breakpoints, whereas most don't. So I figure now I'll just share with you some of the comments that came in uh, with the questionnaire. You, uh, next, Gunnar. So, um, when it came uh, to the technical part that um, one laboratory is currently verifying REST, uh, but not implemented, and another lab is waiting for technical solutions. <clears throat> and as you said, Pierre, the implementation requires much reorganization. And I would imagine for many labs, especially these times, but I think in general too, that that will be an obstacle, at least uh, cause a great delay to be able to find out how can we reorganize. Um, and also with the opening hours. And I'm thinking, you know, um, very many uh, close between, I would say four and six, I would think in general. Now during the Corona, uh, very many have had open 24 seven just to do the Corona. And I figure, you know, positive blood cultures are way more important to know quickly. So we'll see if we can use that a little uh, politically to maybe have longer opening hours for more laboratories. Um, and, uh, and that also describes other uh, aspects some have, maybe the possibility to make antibiotic packages for different time points, um, uh, but uh, they don't, don't have the solution yet. Um, so, uh, and then the last one that they actually just have to do it manually. Uh, if we look at the next one, um, some have partially started and seem to just introduce one bug at the time. So, uh, uh, and which looks like uh, it works well, the first one. Um, and then another, they've uh, started for four of the species, uh, but on selected antibiotics. And that's maybe what I think uh, would be the most useful is to detect resistant mechanisms uh, on the one hand. Uh, we're then using, like you said, the screening uh, with the, the third generation cephalosporins uh, would pretty much give you an idea if it's an ESPL or not. Um, I'll come back to this point at the end. You can take the next one. So like Pierre's lab and others, uh, several mentioned that they actually have alternative rapid methods. Uh, some that seem like uh, are close to the UCAS method, but not exactly. And then uh, one lab that uses both phenotypically and um, genetic um, or genotypic uh, methods. And then actually also one that uses an MIC gradient strip, but uses the UCAS breakpoint. So this is a, a little concern. So we'll definitely um, 
have to address this in our report and maybe talk to those laboratories um, um, just to make sure at least it's properly validated. I'm sure Gunnar, you can give them some <laughs> hints. Um, so the last one is that um, uh, one obstacle is that in Norway with the norm, which is the, the national survey uh, system, we all report uh, in a standard aid that everyone has to do the uh, AST in the same way and report to the norm. So this will come, the dust will come on top uh, as long as uh, it's only for selected and not everyone does it. So it's an extra method that everyone would have to use. Um, the point uh, being able to read after 16 to 20 or maybe even 24 hours, uh, I think is very important. It's very, I'm very glad to hear that UCAS maybe within half a year um, has introduced this, but that, but that means uh, if you don't have very long opening hours, at least you can do the four hour reading. And if it doesn't work, you can actually use this ASD for the next day. So I think this would be a great improvement. And as you mentioned um, that I had told you before, you know, the, the, the fact that ampicillin is lacking from E. coli is of concern because like I said, one thing is to be able to detect resistant mechanisms, which I think is very important so that you can guide them into using a, a broader spectrum or a different antibiotic. But just as important is to know if your empiric therapy actually works to find out the susceptibility, which is uh, difficult with genetic uh, methods. Uh, where when we use ampicillin and gentamicin as our core <laughs> sepsis regimen, um, it's very important for us to know the ampicillin because if we don't, then we and just say, oh yeah, we know it's uh, cefotaxim uh, susceptible. Well, then we actually might uh, cause more use of broad spectrum antibiotics unnecessarily. So um, we have to, I hope we can find some way to maybe um, manage to introduce the ampicillin. Maybe we have to be uh, labs in Norway doing it with guidance from EDL if you, you're not willing to do it for us. <laughs> so I think that was it. You can end with my last slide. Oh yeah, uh, yes. Lab, yes. I think that's enough. <laughs> Thank you, Karianne. <laughs> I forgot I had that one some. <laughs> Thank you very much. I will now open for questions to Per and Karianne and to myself for that matter. Um, there are still some uh, 60 people on board. Um, we will be able to go on for at least another 20 minutes if that is what you want. Um, I would just like to maybe um, let's see where I am here. Uh, just plug uh, for the Nordicast seminars on the Nordicast website. Um, you can find the recordings of previous seminars and this seminar will be on there uh, tonight sometime. And for those of you who are uh, in, interested in the UCAST uh, online seminars, uh, you can see those on that web page. Um, we have already done the general UCAST update, update, the new I, the usefulness of ATU, and all of those three are available already. And on Monday, John Turnich and I will do the wild type MRC and zone diameter distributions and ECOFs. And then we have been asked to do, uh, could you please lead us by the nose through the UCAST breakpoint table? and also spend an hour with us to uh, teach us how to use the UCAS website to its, uh, to its, uh, in its, uh, all the benefits, etc. So those will be coming up as well. Right, so thank you. And let's open up for questions. So I will look at the chat because I can see that there are some questions here. And Arnfin, why don't you unmute and pose your questions live? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Gunnar and Per and, and Karianne. Uh, I think this is really progress uh, for uh, for the microbiology uh, contribution to to better antibiotic stewardship in in, uh, in the most problematic infections. So, so thanks a lot. I have 
Uh, there's a lot of focus on rapid uh, diagnostics and, and uh, rust, uh, in a way, predict both susceptibility uh, and resistance uh, compared to other rapid. Uh, so there's been a lot of focus on genetic uh, tests where you detect resistance genes, but uh, uh, that only predicts, in a way, resistance, and you would like to choose antibiotics based on susceptibility, in a way. So I have two questions. Uh, uh, the one is uh, more to Peer, I think, uh, and maybe Gunnar. Come. Does uh, rust uh, lead to de-escalation of uh, antibiotic use, uh, more ecological use of antibiotics? And then, uh, are there any um, specific uh, drug-bug combinations which are more problematic than other to read, which we should be aware of? I think that's the two main questions. Thank you. Thank you, Anfin. Per, I will let you start off on that. Yeah, I, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, I could tell you a little bit about the uh, problematic drug-bug combinations. And uh, I didn't show you this slide, but it, it uh, uh, shows you the performance after that we uh, evaluated after four months. Uh, we looked at uh, the percentage of uh, isolates or readings, rather, in uh, ATU, for example, and the number of major errors and very major errors. The ma major errors and very major errors were very few. I can give you a, a couple of examples. Uh, we had an E. coli, for example, with, uh, that was susceptible in rapid AST for ciprofloxacin. Uh, with the regular AST, uh, 18 hours, it turned into resistant. It was just on the breakpoint. And uh, we performed a broth microdilution on the isolate and it was susceptible. So if you are close to the breakpoint, sometimes the rapid AST will, you know, they, there are hard isolates. Otherwise, when it comes to uh, the large chunk of <clears throat> ATUs, it's E. coli and Klebsiella. And uh, it's around, we have a, a roughly around 10 to 15% of the of the, the readings that fall into the ATU category. And it's almost always piperacillin, tesobactam, and ciprofloxacin. Uh, usually what we do is that, and it's this is after four hours of reading, is that we incubate the plate another two hours, and then you try to read it uh, again and see if it uh, decides where to go. Um, Normally, we don't do it more than two hours, so up to six hours, and then we just call it quits and wait for the day after. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the most important uh, two combinations. It's piperacillin, tesobactam, and ciprofloxacin, and uh, E. coli, and uh, Klebsiella. Those are hard. I, I can just touch briefly on your other questions on question on Finn, and that um, is about, you know, can we, can we actually, I mean, the English have an expression, the proof is in the pudding. So are people actually de-escalating when they get the, the chance? And I think it's too early to say, because I think it takes a while before people sort of start trusting a new method, start trusting a new procedure. Uh, they have to reorganize as well. You know, most clinical colleagues will, will um, uh, evaluate uh, reports from the microbiology lab in, you know, when they do the rounds at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock or whatever time in the morning they do the rounds and anything that comes in after that will wait until tomorrow's rounds. Um, <clears throat> so if you phone them up and say, you know, the drug you, you have uh, put the patient on uh, was susceptible or the, the bug was susceptible to that agent, the first thing that comes into their head is not, oh, Maybe I should de-escalate. You know, the first thing that comes into their head is perfect, then I don't have to do anything. So I think also clinic, clinical colleagues need to sort of reevaluate their clinical situation and start uh, talking to stewardship groups. Uh, you know, what are the possibilities? What should we probably do rather than just be satisfied that the meropenem we put the patient on was actually active? Uh, should we? actually ask was it also active to ampicillin because then I would consider de-escalating at uh, you know three o'clock in the afternoon to ampicillin rather than just continue on meropenem and I think this is a change in behavior that will take some time and needs the push 
from stewardship people, from infectious disease colleagues, and of course, from microbiologists and pharmacologists. So that's sort of the next step. First, you have to uh, pre present the opportunity and uh, you have to show them that this is not a one-time thing. It's actually a regular thing. It's a new procedure. And then you can start saying, look guys, you're not utilizing the fact that we are giving you new opportunities and you have to rethink your behavior as well as we have rethunk. There's no such word, but never mind. We have rethunk our behavior. So um, uh, I think it takes a while to, to change that. Um, the other question that uh, Inga touched on and which uh, Per alluded to, and which I think you have alluded to as well, Arnfin, is the question of very major and major errors. And first of all, I can say to all of you that if you go to the papers that I presented, the uh, <clears throat> references to the, the description of RAST and also the 55 lab study, there are uh, loads of very major and major error numbers. But remember, and I think people forget that, we have manipulated the VMEs and the MEs by the introduction of the ATU. We have manipulated VMEs and MEs. We have consciously, consciously and deliberately taken away the VMEs and the MEs by introducing the ATU. And that's basically what CLSI have been doing for all these years by introducing very wide eye categories. If you have a wide eye category, you will never jump from S to R or from R to S because the distance you have to jump is so far that it will not happen. And then you can do away with all your VMEs and MEs and just as a thought experiment, let's just consider the possibility of always reporting an I and never reporting S's or R's. We will never have a single VME or a single ME. <coughs> so we have manipulated the RAST by introducing the ATU and by deciding on the width of the ATU, we have been able to take away consciously and deliberately VMEs and ME. So when you look at the VME numbers and ME numbers, they're all in the, in the vicinity of 0.3%, 1.1%, you know, they're very low and they, they seem very impressive. But then you have to remember that they are all manipulated to be very impressive. And of course, not to impress you guys, not to impress us, but to make sure that the patient and our clinical colleagues do not experience true VMEs and MEs that will actually rock the boat for them. Is that, is that clear? Uh, as you know, from a theoretical point of view, that's very important to understand that. Can I tell you how our uh, MEs, VMEs look, what they look like for the four, first four months that we introduced rapid ASD? Uh, 0.2, 0.3, uh, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.15, 0.16, 0.17, 0.18, 0.19, 0.20, 0.21, 0.22, 0.23, 0.24, 0
when you have your afternoon rounds, you have in almost all of these cases, uh, a rapid AST result when you have your afternoon rounds. So normally we have a rapid AST reading time at 13, um, around one o'clock in the afternoon. And if that fails, you have a secondary one at, at, at three o'clock normally. That's regularly what happens. Um, thank you very much for the very nice presentation. And at Karolinska, we are performing uh, Rust with the help of Inga, established it in even in the uh, uh, weekends. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is regarding the other uh, isolates. If, if you see, we perform our rest before we have the ID for all gram negatives after uh, microscopy. And if we get six millimeters, we know that it will be resistant for that very isolate if it's in Klebsia, Lyrogenes, or uh, whatever. Uh, do you use this information? The first question. And the second information, what is the error margin? I mean, Normally, it's two, three millimeters when you read this diffusion, uh, as far as I remember. Uh, do you, if, if it's on the limit, if it's like one millimeter uh, to the susceptible, uh, how do you interpret that? Can I start, Pat, and then hand over to you? Um, just to say that the ATU swallows swallows that sort of uh, variation and it is meant to absorb that so the whole idea about having the you is to absorb all different reasons for variation in the bug in the species and in the agent and in the test and the natural variation in the test and the fact that not every disc is exactly the same etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think uh, that part uh, is explained uh, uh, via the ATU. Um, per, would you like to address the other question? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so we uh, we perform rapid AST on all pretty much gram negatives, uh, and even if it's uh, a species without uh, rust breakpoints, like you say, if there is a six millimeter zone, then you know it's probably going to be resistant. So if we have information that the patient is on a antibiotic that is obviously not going to work, we pretty much give them a call and say, look, this is a very, very preliminary result, but you might want to reconsider this. So we, 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 we try to report all the information we have and to make it meaningful, um, but we, we don't make it formally in the um, with an electronic report, but we, we give them a call and inform them of what we so I, I expect. Think to summarize, Volkan, uh, what you're saying and what Pat is saying, that you're doing a sensible thing, but to take that into a standardized method is a completely different thing. Um, and UCAST um, has um, been um, obliged, if you like, to perform standardized and to produce standardized methods. So if we were to include, let's say, Klebsia lausane or Entrobacter cloacae or Proteus mirabilis or Providencia or Morganella or you know, whatever, we would have to set up um, the bottles, uh, the four manufacturers, uh, the discs, the antibiotics, the reading times, et cetera, et cetera, from the very start. And so far, no one has sort of uh, come running with a, a purse of money to say, look, guys, here's the money. Could you please do it? But I now hear that the Norwegians will supply the money for the ampicillin test. And that's very reassuring. <laughs> so we're looking forward to implementing that on the new year. No problem. Um, and we will include a few other antibiotics for of your choosing while we do it. And my good news is that if you want to include three other antibiotics, those will be for free. And Pacilla will carry the whole cost for the experiment. So take it away. <laughs> I'm sorry to take that money position, but you know, developing Rust in itself is not 10,000 euro. It's not 100,000 euro. It's considerably more than that. And every time we need to add a species, we need to start from the beginning. And there is another aspect to this, that is every time we need to add an antibiotic, and we do need to add antibiotics. We are now starting up in the Penumbrella term, 
we're going to have to start up. You know, some of those antibiotics that people are in desperate need of, not for stewardship reasons, but because they have nothing to treat the patient with. Uh, and if we're lucky, there will be a hole somewhere, you know, where ampicillin can be squeezed in because we only have two or three discs uh, for new antibiotics or for very potent antibiotics. And then maybe we can slip amp ampicillin in there. Uh, I really understand the problem with standardization and, and UCAS uh, uh, approach. But on the other hand, in the, this is a preliminary result. And we do have six no, millimeter. No, no. Volkan, you have to say that, and, and we didn't stress that, we don't consider this necessarily a preliminary result. I understand that lots of colleagues will want to do a normal uh, AST and set up a regular AST uh, for various reasons, and Karianna brought one forward, namely that their uh, surveillance system requires this. Um, but it's the recommendation is not that you need to do a, a regular uh, susceptibility test beside the 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 rest test yeah i understand but yeah. i mean at the same time especially piperacillin tazobactam is not ready after four hours in our hands anyways for for most of the gram negatives or most of the e coli uh, or half at least so it will be a preliminary result at four hours but at the same time if it's six millimeter for proteus can it be susceptible after 24 hours i mean probably it... not probably not so that would be my guess that it's not going to be susceptible if the test is read properly if you have disregarded the swarming if there is swarming blah 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 and all that it will probably not change but where do you then draw the limit is it at eight millimeters or 12 millimeters and how many proteas do you need to look at before you can promise people that they can do this and are people going to say, yeah, six millimeters, that's fine. You know, the others, I don't need any information yeah. on. Can I report an R on eight millimeters maybe also, or maybe on 12, or could I report susceptible at 14? So you're sort of uh, opening up a quagmire, uh, which UCAS would not be able to extradite themselves from. You have to do it properly or not at all. In the local lab, you can decide to take responsibility, you know, for most anything, uh, poor COVID tests, uh, you know, whatever. You can, as the medical um, uh, responsible, medically responsible person, you can decide to take responsibility. That's fine. But, you know, with 80,000 downloads per month uh, for UCAST is the current number, we cannot do things sort of uh, on the fly. I'm sorry. Thanks. Inga has a comment on polymer, uh, polymicrobial infections. Yes, thank you, Gunnar, and thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, fine. Yeah, and thank you, Per. We have uh, been using uh, an adapted version of uh, your Excel file uh, for uh, about one year, and it's working very well. Uh, so thank you for that. And I would li I also like to say to all other laboratories that it's actually possible to adapt uh, the Vectra um, Excel file to, to your own local uh, adaption uh, of uh, uh, rapid uh, AST. But uh, the errors that we have seen during the last years is um, have, have mostly been associated with polymer microbial infections and of course that is something that uh, uh, is a, a caution uh, that you have to take into consideration if you want to decide not to do uh, um, a normal AST. I think. If, I think if you decide to not do a normal AST it's because you had a good result with the with the rapid AST so whenever you are in problems when you encounter problems of any kind whether it's polymicrobial uh, a, a polymicrobial result in your blood culture or whether you're not really happy with uh, the you have difficulties in reading or whatever then of course you have to do a proper proper regular test if you like yes. uh, so but, but, but we're not but, saying uh, that you never have to do a test. We're not just saying that if you are comfortable with the result you get after four or six hours, yeah. 
Uh, you the thing is that we have had a few inf infections where we have had sub uh, populations with both an ESB and uh, and uh, uh, a susceptible E. coli, and that you wouldn't have seen if you hadn't done a, a normal AST also. Okay. But th but they are very few, very few. But we have had the the few ever errors that we have had have been uh, like that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And Per, I think you can expect to have a number of requests for that Excel file, if I read Inga's praise uh, correctly. We have a, another um, uh, question from Arnfin. Any comments on the selective use of RAST, only screening for ESBL, blah, 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 and MRC, VRE, et cetera. And I don't know if anyone has used RAST only to do that. I, I know that a lot of people have used it as a complement to the ordinary RAST. And you know what? Once they have a result, they will both interpret it according to the breakpoints in the breakpoint table, but they will also uh, interpret it according to the special breakpoints then for screening for carbapenemases or ES other ESBLs or MRSAs and whatever, uh, and with success. Has anyone tried to, to use RAST only? Because that's what you mean, isn't it? Uh, on fin only for uh, to detect or exclude the possibility of an ESPL or a carbapenemase or an MRSA or a VRE. Yeah, that was a comment from uh, one of the labs in Norway in, in yeah. my own uh, survey. And I also heard from the Danish during the Nordic cost uh, meeting we had that uh, some labs use it more selectively. Yeah. For some reason. Mm -hmm. I, I can just tell you that we, we don't use it that way we, since we use uh, use it with more antibiotics. But um, in the ATU category, I think there were zero cefoxetins uh, from Staph aureus. So they were either clearly S or R. Uh, and of course, we had a couple of cephalosporins in the ATU category for E. coli and um, Klebsiella. But I don't think there were any major or very major errors. Um, regarding cephalosporins just a small comment <clears throat> no i think that when you use the special breakpoints for uh, detecting resistance mechanisms you can expect that the normal result if you like is actually in or below the atu uh, so it gives you an opportunity to sort of uh, take your result twice to the table and interpret it according to the S and R interpretation, but you can also take your result and interpret it as to a possible or probable uh, mechanism of resistance. Um, you have to, of course, be aware of the fact that although we have managed to get hold of lots and lots of different E. coli and Klebsiella with many different resistance mechanisms, we cannot exclude the possibility that an OXA48 of some specific kind or OXA200, whatever, uh, would slip by. Um, on the other hand, we had 10 strains sent from Collindale, uh, the public health laboratory in England, reference laboratory, because they were complaining that they couldn't pick up this OXA uh, type uh, with the agar dilution that they used for uh, MIC testing. And they asked us if we could pick it up with broth microdilution, and we had no problem picking it up with the meropenem disc uh, diffusion screening test. But some of those were right on the verge of slipping into the wild type with the broth micro test. So um, even with regular testing, you know, with uh, 18 hour broth micro or 16 to 20 hour uh, uh, disc diffusion, you will encounter strains that are not detected. Um, I think from my perspective, using setting up RAST for only, only for this reason, you know, ESBLs and carbapenemases and MRSAs and VREs, um, to me, that seems like a lot of work and a very little harvest. <laughs> um, so um, I think you can actually have it both ways. So why not utilize that? Any more questions? It's now five minutes past. 
some people have left us. There are 28 remaining, but you, it's probably the most important 28, so that's okay. Um, if you have more questions, we're happy to discuss with you. But if that is... If, if, if final from me, good night. Yeah? Uh, you were stating that uh, you are plans to extend the uh, antibiotic panel in Rust. Yeah. So could you uh, elaborate on that or is it not, uh, let's say, details not uh, in yet? Well, I think I'll take you back to that the first table that I showed you. I'm trying to back up quickly here. Here we go. Oh, too far. So if you look at this table, you can see that in 2020, we introduced ceftazidimavibactam, ceftolozane, tazobactam. Uh, when we started up RAST, we used meropenem as a proof of concept carbapenem. So uh, during the following year, we then developed imipenem. Um, we used ciprofloxacin for the proof of concept, and we've now included levofloxacin. Um, we didn't include, for some reason, I can't re remember why we didn't include trimethoprim sulfotoxazole at the very start, but we didn't. Um, so the yellow ones there, the five, were introduced in 2020. There will be no new uh, introductions in 2021. The introduction uh, in 2021 will be the uh, prolonged incubation and the possible reading at 16, 20, and 24 hours. Uh, so uh, hopefully we will get into extending the panel of antibiotics, provided I get a steering committee agreement on that, uh, maybe for 2022 or very late 2021. It takes about um, six to nine months to run through the complete material in a proper way and to do it uh, properly. Um, and of course, when we introduce ampicillin and cephidrical or, you know, whatever, um, we will have to read at four, six, eight hours and 16, 20 and 24 hours. And it's pretty taxing on the te technical staff that has to accomplish that. So uh, it's not something you do very lightly. What agents would you uh, really want to have uh, for a septic patient that walks into the ER uh, unknown to everyone? No one knows what he or she is suffering from. It could be a pneumonia. It could be a urinary tract infection gone wild, um, or it could be a bowel that has burst or whatever. I don't know. What antibiotics would you really want to have? Karianna has already stated ampicillin, which I thought was sort of uh, out of the question by now, but uh, there you go. The English say we, we need amoxicillin clavulanic acid, and I say, well, you've got piperacillin and tazobactam. There's got to be a limit to everything, but they are adamant they want amoxicillin clavulanic acid. So there we have two plugs to fill. They would never dream of using ampicillin. Uh, uh, you know, the, the thing is, too, if we're, like you said, you can use just this uh, um, AST method, but then if we always have ampicillin, uh, you would have to do, uh, not yep. just because of norm, because you yep. were lacking yep. important uh, antibiotics. So uh, yeah. maybe yeah. not for the first 24 hours, uh, if you have a septic, really bad patient, you wouldn't choose ampicillin, but uh, there are quite a few that aren't that uh, first of all, that um, ill, uh, and then also you want to de-escalate when they get better. So yeah, so I think there are many reasons to keep keep the um, to get the ampicillin. And if you look at the table, and this had been ten years ago, everyone would have said, "How could you even think of producing a table like this without including scafuroxin?" You will see that cefuroxim is not there. 
and it's because UCAS does not consider cefiroxim a real a real alternative for empirical use with uh, gram-negative septicemia. I, I'm going to leave you. A lot, a lot of people have uh, opinions about what needs to be there. Um, I think those that are there, uh, everyone agrees they have to be there, although there is some discussion as to whether we need the aminoglycosides there. And they've been taken off the Pseudomonas panel, as you know. Um, I think everyone agreed that trimethoprim sulfamidoxazole was maybe not you know, empirical therapy for gram negatives, but a lot of the urologists and, and that section of humanity uh, have a tendency to use that for urinary tract infections and for prophylaxis and God knows what. So it might be a good idea to actually have it there. Um, so it's, it's a difficult discussion to have. I think maybe one of the things is that many, uh, you know, they have them in the hospital as long as possible, but still many uh, end up then having a little tail with oral treatment afterhand and that's where you have to have maybe the trim so far yeah hmm. that's true so uh i think we're now um losing people uh, there are 21 left um if everyone uh, feels that they've had an opportunity to ask the questions they wanted to ask or discuss what they wanted to discuss Anyone else? I think this is the end of today's online seminar. You will find it on the website and you can use your evening to watch it again. Uh, and you can have a look at the um, uh, PowerPoint presentation with the pairs and Karyandas and my slides. And all of it will be available eventually on the Nordicast webpage. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you especially to Per and Karyanda. Um, and uh, see you all next time. There is no more uh, currently planned seminar from Nordicast. But as you saw, there are quite a few planned from UCAST, and they are all uh, according to the same model, namely they are sent as live seminars at eight o'clock in the morning, one o'clock in noon and four o'clock in the afternoon. And that, of course, is to make it possible for you to choose a suitable time, but also for Brazilians and Australians and God knows what to, to attend. Uh, the one on Monday is actually timed slightly differently, and that's because John and I have to to both find a suitable time for Australia and, and Europe. And the one at 1600 would be sort of four o'clock in the morning for John, and um, he says he's too old for that. So there we go. All right, everyone. Thank you for today, and bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>